A small plastic sphere charged to minus 10 nanocoulombs is held one centimeter above a small glass bead at rest on a table. The bead has a mass of 15 milligrams and a charge of 10 nanocoulombs. Will the glass bead leap up to the plastic sphere? To tackle this problem, let's go ahead and first sketch a picture. So I'll first draw the plastic sphere. I'll indicate that this sphere has a charge Q sub P. Actually, I see that could get a little bit cluttered, so I'll just put this off to the side. It has a charge of Q sub P. P is corresponding to plastic, and remember, Q is our arbitrary variable representing charge. So the charge of the plastic sphere is equal to minus 10 nanocoulombs. Now, a nano is 10 to the minus 9. So this is minus 10 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. The sphere is fixed in place, so I'll indicate that just by drawing something that maybe looks like a structure holding it in place. And we know that sphere is one centimeter above a glass bead. So that glass bead is at rest on a table. So I'll indicate the table right there. Now the mass of the glass bead, which I'll use a subscript G to represent glass, the mass of the glass bead is 15 milligrams. A milligram is a millionth of a kilogram. So I'll write this as 15 times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms, so I am in my SI units. Now the charge of the glass bead, it's opposite to the charge of the plastic bead. So I will write positive 10 nanocoulombs, and again, that would be 10 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Being opposite in charge, I know that these two particles, the plastic sphere and the glass bead, will exert equal magnitudes of force on each other, but opposite in direction along the straight line that connects them. So I will indicate the force on the glass bead to be equal to the electric force on the glass bead from the plastic bead. So notice my subscript. I wrote E just to remind me that this is the electric force. G is the object being acted upon. This is the glass bead. P is the object doing the acting. That's the plastic sphere. Due to Newton's third law, I know there is an equal magnitude of force on the plastic sphere, but opposite in direction. So I'll write this as the electric force or the Coulomb force on the plastic sphere from the glass bead. What we're really concerned with, the glass bead. So in order to determine whether the glass bead will leap up, that would have to mean that the electric force pulling up on the bead from the sphere is greater than the force of gravity pulling down on the bead. So I am going to illustrate the force of gravity on the bead. So the force of gravity on the bead, on the glass bead, and I'll just keep it as a G, or maybe I could write force of gravity on the glass bead, F sub G G, is equal to, well, we know force of gravity is equal to the mass of an object times its free fall acceleration. Now, we should really indicate all of the forces acting on the bead, because from Newton's second law, once we sum up the forces, we'll be able to equate that to the product of mass times acceleration. And if the acceleration is greater than zero, if the acceleration is upward, we know that the glass bead will leap up. If the acceleration is downward, then we know the glass bead will stay in place. Now, another force that's acting on the bead is the normal force. 
So I'll indicate a normal force going in the upward direction. Now that we have identified the forces acting on the bead, I'm going to construct a free body diagram and use that diagram to help me determine Newton's second law of motion. Remember, a free body diagram is a diagram that illustrates just a single object or a system of objects and all of the forces acting on that object. For this free body diagram, I'll just illustrate the component, the x component of force, which there is none on this problem, the y component of force, and I will label this diagram glass bead, so we know that the object represented at the center of the diagram corresponds to the glass bead. Now remember, for free body diagrams, we illustrate all of the forces um, the tails of the forces originating at the origin. So what I have so far is the uh, electric force, Coulomb force pulling up on the glass bead. So that's the Coulomb force on the glass bead from the plastic sphere. And we have the gravitational force pulling down. and we have the normal force acting up. From the free body diagram, all I have to do is add up the forces along each axis. Since we are only in along the y-axis, or we only have forces along the y-axis, I could just add some all of those up. So we will say the force along the y-axis for the bead is equal to the Coulomb force on the bead from the sphere plus the normal force on the bead minus the force of gravity acting on the bead is equal to the mass of the bead times the acceleration in the y direction for the bead. If the bead leaps up, when we this quantity would evaluate to be a positive quantity. So this is what we get from Newton's second law. But now let's look at each one of these pieces in turn. So, the Coulomb force on the bead from the sphere can be given by that Coulomb constant times the product of the charges, the product of the bead, the product of the plastic sphere, divided by the distance between them squared. So I should go back and label my picture with the distance between the two. Since I introduced the variable r, I should label my picture with that variable to communicate what it means. So this is r equals one centimeter. One centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. So we know what Coulomb's law tells us for the electric force on the glass bead from the plastic sphere. What do you think the normal force is? Now remember, the normal force is not the force that counters gravity. It is the force of contact between two different surfaces. So we, can't, we don't have a single formula for the normal force like we have for a gravitational force or for a Coulomb force. Rather, the normal force is determined from Newton's second law based off of other forces that are interacting with the object. So for this one, if the electric force pulling up 
on the on the glass bead if that is stronger if that is larger than the weight of the bead than the gravitational force on the bead then the bead will leap up so if we look at the instant the instant that the bead the instant before the bead actually leaps up the normal force would go to zero so let's look at that limiting condition let's assume that the normal force is going to zero and let's see what would happen so i am going to set the normal force equal to zero in the problem so that leaves us with the gravitational force the gravitational force on the bead is equal to just the weight of the bead so that's the mass of the bead times the free fall acceleration. So we can now rewrite Newton's second law slightly simplified or really expanded out with the quantities we know. So we had the Coulomb force on the bead from the plastic sphere minus the weight of the bead is equal to the bead's mass times its acceleration in the y direction. We're looking for the value of the acceleration for the y direction to see if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, the bead leaps up. If it's negative, the bead is, is not going to leap up. We said that the Coulomb force is equal to the constant times the product of the charges divided by the distance squared minus the weight of the glass bead is equal to the mass of the glass bead times the acceleration in the y direction. So let's isolate the acceleration in the y direction. The acceleration in the y direction is equal to the Coulomb's constant times the product of the charges divided by the mass of the glass bead times the distance between the two squared minus the free fall acceleration due to gravity. Okay, so we have now gone about as far as we could go in terms of variables. Let's go ahead and plug in numbers and see if we get a positive number or a negative number. So the acceleration due to gravity is, well, the Coulomb's constant is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth <clears throat> newtons per Coulomb squared, and that actually should be a Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. So that is K, the product of the charges. So the product of the magnitude of the charges would be 10 times 10 to the minus 9th Coulomb squared. Well, you might be wondering, Mel, one of those charges is negative. So shouldn't you instead write minus 10 times 10 to the minus 9th coulombs for one of those charges? And the answer is no. Well, the reason why we don't need that minus 10 times that minus sign, it's because we already compensated for that minus sign in our initial sketch. Remember, in our initial sketch, we indicated the direction that the force is acting on each particle. The glass bead is being pulled up. The plastic sphere is being pulled down. Beca and we knew the direction of those forces because we knew that they are opposite charge opposite charges attract along the same line. 
And so that told us that the electric force acting on the glass bead is upward. So when I did my Newton's laws equations, that upward portion just ended up being this positive sign in front of my force, which means that everything else is a magnitude. All of my variables represent magnitudes. So that minus sign, we already compensated for it. And since we know that the direction of the force is upward, this, this set of quantities are, represents just positive magnitudes. So this is now divided by the mass of the glass bead, which was 15 times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms times the distance between the glass bead squared, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, quantity squared. To save myself some space, let's go ahead and move this to give myself more room to work. Let's try that again. So I'm going to move these quantities. Hey, let's try that one more time. I'm having some selection challenges right now. We'll move it to the left. Now I have a little bit more room to work with. So this big quantity here, we will now subtract G, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. So before I plug this into my calculator, since I wrote out all of the quantities their, and their units, I could do a quick unit check with what I have written before I even take the time to plug it into my calculator. That's useful because I know that if the units don't check out, I made a mistake somewhere. So let's go ahead and do the unit check on this. So I see that in the numerator of the first expression, I have, I'm sorry, in the denominator, I have a coulomb squared. That coulomb squared cancels with two coulombs in the numerator. In the numerator, I have a meter squared. That meter squared cancels with a meter in the denominator. So for the first expression, I have a Newton per kilogram. So a Newton per kilogram, you might remember is equivalent to a meters per second squared, but let's go ahead and do that just for practice. A Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared per kilogram. So this, the kilograms cancel, and I've confirmed that a Newton per kilogram is the same thing as a meter per second squared. What that means is this entire first expression ends up being units of meters per second squared. Since the units check out, I probably didn't make a major mistake if I made one at all. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and plug these numbers into my calculator. So we end up with an acceleration of to one significant figure, 600 meters per second squared. Wow, 600 meters per second squared? That is roughly 60 times the acceleration of gravity. So that sphere is going to not only leap, it's going to rocket its way off the table.